This whole post is complete garbage. See, the thing is, is, you know, back when the TV came out, everybody said radio was going to die. And then all of a sudden, like when color TV, like when all this stuff came out, everyone said the thing before it's going to die. And it's so crazy to me because they don't die. They just change. I was telling Benji this this week, but my husband and I are going through a late stage in life tattoo phase. (laughs) <laughs> which I know, I know I who it. knew. <laughs> so like, we're both like evenly getting tattoos. So when I get a tattoo, he'll get one. And when he gets a tattoo, I'll get one. And we have to like sit there and think for a couple of weeks, what our next tattoo should like, be. It sounds like more like a competition than anything else between you two. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally a collaboration. It's a collaborative <laughs> art project. So we we've been going through this phase together. It's been really fun, but like I've kind of wanted to be more like a Miley Cyrus, you know, <laughs> multiple stickers kind of tattoo person. And he's going for a little bit more of the bigger stuff. So I got one this weekend and it's like right here. It's a palm tree. And oh, it's, a, cool. it's an Aspen tree because I'm from Florida and I live in Colorado. I've been here almost 10 years. Um, and I like it, but I thought like this is a great spot for a tattoo because when I look forward, you can't see it. It's on my the bottom of my like on my forearm. So what I didn't realize is that in every Zoom meeting, I see the tattoo and it is all I focused on this week. <laughs> but my husband made a really good point. He was actually like, I actually think that people are really like they find tattoos almost like a safe space sometimes with mm-hmm. one another because if a lot of people have tattoos now. And so when they see somebody else that they know and it's like peeking out just a little bit, they're like, oh, look, you get it. You have one or like you're a person outside of your Zoom world. Like I'm wearing long sleeves. You can barely see it poke out, but it just barely is there. So I thought that was a cool add on and like very sales rep of him to say like it actually could bring some kind of um, comfort to the situation. And I appreciated it. See, I, I struggle because I'm I'm too awkward of a human that I feel like tattoos just make me look like a poser. Like I'm too like gangly to get a big one and I'm not like, like I, and then the small ones I don't really like. So I just feel like if I were, I really want one, but if I get one, I feel like it makes me a poser. Like I'm not the type of human to have one. You know what I mean? It's like in I my don't brain. Know what you my mean, brain Cause I love inside. tattoos. And if you got one, we'd be fully supportive. <laughs> Oh, I know you guys. That thing is everybody I know would be. I would be, but for whatever reason, I feel like I'm just too. I'm just not the person who has them. You know, like I I would have to go like all in and get a ton. But if I just get one, I don't know. I just feel like I'm just. It's just like too awkward on my body. Allie, as (laughs) soon as you opened with this story, it reminded me one of my favorite podcasts. They posted a stat this week because it's forty percent of those under thirty have a tattoo. So it's like, I mean, that's a large amount. And I just remember like being younger and it, it was like this crazy thing. If you had tattoos on your arm, because you might never get a job, <laughs> like yes. the fear around it was so high. And now it's just like, really? I can't even imagine putting myself back in that frame of mind, but I like your new tattoos. So we're not staring <laughs> at them, even if you are. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. My two-year-old likes them too. She's always like, cool tattoo, mama. <laughs> Now she's going to get in on the competition. If y'all have six, she needs six. Right. Yeah, she wants all dinosaurs, maybe Bluey. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, this episode this new is we want to talk about short form video and long form video. Uh, I saw a post by Aniket Mishra. I think that's how you pronounce your name. Uh, I'm sorry if I, I mispronounced it there, but want to bring this post to us because we often talk about uh, social, where social media is going. We want to continue to be thinking through these things. And I think short form video being on such a rise does bring questions. to like, how does this fit in your long form strategy? I know I've asked questions around like, even from this podcast, how many shorts should we put be pulling? What kind of content do we want to be making with all this stuff? So there's plenty to talk about, but I'll, I'll just kick it off by reading, uh, some of this post. It's a longer post, so I may jump around a little bit. But he says, rising popularity of YouTube shorts raises raises concerns over decline in long-form content. People were very excited when shorts was launched, but I was skeptical from day one. After using them, 
on our clients and studying their data, I was sure this would destroy channels in the coming times. And we immediately stopped using them. I think that's uh, a warning, a weird, uh, uh, that's a red flag for me, but We'll keep going. Surely after back in March, I gave a quote uh, re reporting on the same issue. The overall impressions and views are drastically up approximately 60% for the creators we work with, but watch time and revenue have taken a big hit. Giving a percentage for the decrease is a bit tricky, but I can say that they are down by 20%. The surge in shorts popularity can be attributed to the widespread success of TikTok and the evolving preferences of audiences who favor concise, mobile-friendly content. According to uh, FT within uh, YouTube's corridors, concerns brew among senior staff members as they perceive shorts are potentially eroding the foundation of the platform's traditional long-form video content. Long form videos, which are more profitable due to increased ad opportunities, are reportedly dying out. Despite a recent uptick, YouTube's ad revenues has experienced declines, raising concerns among staff and affected and affecting creators' behavior. YouTube argues that shorts complement other formats like audio and live streams, and they even launched a new feature bridging the gap between shorts and long form, but internal data suggests a different story. While YouTube has tried to enhance shorts with lucrative payment mechanisms and in-app editing tools, adopting among creators still needs to grow. And then he just says, thoughts. So <laughs> I don't think we're going to agree with them, but Brent, take it away. No, this is, this is absolute garbage. <laughs> this is complete. This is, this, this whole post is complete garbage. See, the thing is, is, you know, back when the TV came out, everybody said radio was going to die. And then all of a sudden, like when color TV, like when all this stuff came out, everyone said the thing before it's going to die. And it's so crazy to me because they don't die. They just change. So every time this happens, like when people start being able to watch movies on their phone, oh my God, the movie theater is going to die. Oh, I knocked over my water. Hang on. He's, He's so, so passionate. passionate, everybody. Like he's got water <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> no, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. But it's like when phones came out, people say like, well, movie theaters are going to die. No one's going to go because they can watch it on Netflix at home. They're not dying. They're just changing. And the issue is that when I see this, when people say like, oh, you have to stop doing it because it's, it's dying. That is a big red flag to me that it's not dying. It just means they have not adapted. Because like long, long form content is not what it used to be. There's no question about that. But to say it's dying and that it's in decline and all of that, I disagree with that completely. Like the way YouTube was 10 years ago is not the way you should be doing it today. And I see it over and over and over with creators, content marketers, every, anyone who does that position. They love to say when they can't figure something out that it's dying. Like people in two years are going to say TikTok is dying. People are going to say Instagram is dying. Like this is going to happen. It's it's not a matter of like people said when TikTok came out that Instagram was dying. No one's going to go on Instagram anymore. They just go for different reasons. Everybody's mom is on fa on Facebook, you know, sharing minion memes and and asking how their grandkids are doing. Yes, it's very different than how we used it 10 years ago. But um, it, it's just, it's adapted. So if as a company, you are not looking at how to adapt and just accepting its death, then you are failing to do good marketing campaigns because it like you can keep long form content going, but a lot of people just don't think about, you know, 10 steps ahead of how do we get ahead of this? How do we take advantage of this change? The most successful people on TikTok specifically were people who adapted early and struck while the iron's hot. If you're trying to get on TikTok right now, it's going to be very, very, very hard for you to, to, to find success on there uh, than it was two years ago. So when a new platform comes out and everyone's saying the old platforms are dying, instead of saying this all sucks, we shouldn't do it, I don't like how this works, you should try to adapt, figure out how to put your brand, your voice into that platform and you'll see very early success. I will say, I mean, this is my biggest tip right now in creating content for B2B companies. YouTube Shorts is 100% where it's at if you're looking for reach. Not a lot of people are using it yet. Um, so there's less videos, less competition. So they're pushing, but there's a lot of users. So it's pushing out content. I mean, you guys would agree the content we've put out for this show by far the best platform has been YouTube shorts. And it's even got an added benefit that if someone likes your YouTube short and they see the clip, 
all they have to do is click your profile and they have your whole episode right there. And to, to further go into how we know that, you know, long form isn't dying. A lot of people don't know this. TikTok has a patent for music and podcasts. They just haven't launched anything yet. And back in April, I think it was, TikTok was exploring uh, more long form content over 10 minutes with, as a beta with some creators. It is not going away. They want it. I mean, a lot of people are scrolling TikTok and they want that long form video to play in the background or play like while they're working on something or while they're driving. People want it. People need it because they you don't always have that short attention span kind of a moment where you're focused on your phone. Um, you want stuff to you know listen to in the background, listen to while you're working, listen to while you're driving. You guys got me so worked up. I feel like I just gave like a whole like rant there. And I don't even know. I'm like losing my own train of thought. But um, no, it, it's just, it's my ultimate frustration is that when people can't figure something out that they used to know, it's easier to accept that it's dying than to accept that I need to change how I'm doing my job. B2B brands are on a hamster wheel trying to create more and more awareness. They're putting so much work into creating awareness and not nearly enough work into making sure that the content they're putting out is actually good. You can pay to build awareness. Brands do that all the time. But does the content resonate? The question should be, how do we create content that builds affinity? And that's where Sweetfish comes in. We're here to help you build your market's favorite show, not just another show. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. I feel like we're in high school in like a cafeteria and Brent was about to get in a fight and I'm like holding him back. <laughs> and then I just like let him go and he just started going for it. Uh, here, here's the deal. I, I picked this partially because I do, I do disagree with the take. I'll just give personal experience over the last eight months or so. My thinking on short form content has evolved pretty substantially because of what Brent's talking about, t just testing things. When shorts and TikTok and all, just the rise of this that format of video was like all the rage, which clearly it still still is, but it's been out now for, for long enough to where it's not at the same hype level. I think people were trying to figure out specifically with long form content, how many shorts do I make from this? Like, do we cut it into a million clips and just like have all these endless shorts and we optimize all our long form videos just to like get the shortest content out of it. And like everything has to be like for the 15 second attention span and like all good questions. But if you're based out of like a place of like fear or frustration, not testing any of those things, you're never going to know what you where to like kind of settle and allow yourself to go, okay, this is our strategy for right now. We'll reassess a little bit down the road or we'll try more down the road. So I had episodes that came out where I want, I was like cutting five micro videos per episode. And it was so tiring because of the output for those shorts. And if you were asking me and Brent might disagree, but like right now, I, I wouldn't use that strategy. I wouldn't be just trying to pull as many micro videos as possible from these episodes. But I thought that way for a while. Then we tested and it got to a place where I was like, no, I, I'm kind of cool with like one to two really well cut clips, allowing them to do their job. And especially at our cadence, like that allows for a pretty good stream of content from each of these episodes. And it's an invitation to go check out the long form. And if you don't, it's just a little teaser you're seeing our face in front of you as you scroll and maybe down the road you'll be interested, but it's also like a proper perspective of like, what does a short facilitate and what is your long form content facilitate? And they're separate things. Like you're, you're going to shorts in times when you don't have the bandwidth to go really deep on an idea. You're scrolling past cat videos and then all of a sudden it's B2B marketing. Like that's a very different space than when I am, let's say on a long, longer car ride in the morning and I'm in a space where I'm like, I want to think about B2B marketing and I want to allow my, my thinking on this topic to evolve. So I'm consuming 40 minutes or however long that, that full length episode is. It's a different brain space, but I want to be as someone who creates content in your in both of those formats. So I'm not going to exclude myself from one of them just because it doesn't give a great return to people immediately going and listening to my long form content. Last thing I'll say, Allie, and then I'll give it to you. 
But I even think as we evolve, as YouTube evolves and you can click through from a, epi- from a, from a short straight to an episode, that's great. Like make it easier. Personally, I'm skeptical that you're going to see this skyrocket in views just because user behavior is different. So it's great that it can facilitate a click through, but it's not necessarily, I think, going to just make your podcast blow up or your longer form content blow up because they're four different times. They're for you, you go to those things for different reasons. And I think we need to just be okay with that. So Allie, what are your thoughts on, on this post? Anything you want to add here? Yeah. I mean, I think like personally, when I think of long form video, I still use it. I use it for a couple things. Like if I'm evaluating software and trying to understand what a piece of software does and how I can use it myself, like I go straight to Google or YouTube to like kind of see if there's a video on it so I can really get a full understanding of the product itself. So in the buying process, I use long form video and I want to see more long form videos. Like I want to see how a specific area of the product can help me with a specific use case and how I can do that. Like I want the how to on the long form videos. And then I also think that long form videos are really helpful for um, search. You know, like I think like if you're doing a long form strategy, like you should really be doing it with search in mind. Um, because of kind of going back to that how to aspect, like how to uh, set a um, your first sales call or what have you, like all of the tips should be in a long form video, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, everything should be animated, easy to get through and then easy to take home. It should be embedded within a long form blog post on the same topic with a similar keyword. They should work together to get you more views and more readers, you know, they, that's the best way that I see long form video kind of still continuing on and, and, um, being useful for companies. Um, so yeah, I also think we've been looking at watch times going down for like years at this point. Like I remember being in a meeting in like 2017 and one of our leaders was like, our Facebook watch times are eight seconds. How do we get them over that? You know, it's just, (laughs) I like this pain point is very, very normal and standard and something we've seen for a long time. So I don't think the introduction of shorter form content has created that. I think it's always been there personally. No, I think here's the thing. If I could give one piece of advice to B2B companies out there that are creating video content, obviously it's way more nuanced than than as, as simple as I like to make it sound. The further down the funnel, the longer the video. So yeah. if you're going for top of funnel, keep it short, punchy, easy. If you're going, Ali just confirmed this. You, you just said, Ali, when you're looking for, you know, how to understand, you know, a product and you're looking to buy, you watch the long form content. If you're not, you know, creating long form content, you are missing out on buyers. If you're not creating short term content, you're missing out on attracting people who could potentially become buyers. You have to create both but you can't do it the opposite way. None of your top of funnel are going to care about your long form content and your, you know, bottom of funnel people are going to get annoyed by your top form content to create for different people, obviously more nuanced than that, but that's the most simple way on all platforms. The further down the funnel, the longer the video. I love that. And I'm thinking about use case too, just from a media perspective real quick. There are podcasts that I just don't have time in my day to listen to but I am connected to at a very high level. So in marketing, we would call that absolute top of funnel is like, I consume their shorts. I consume their TikTok and that's all I consume. They have not converted me into long form content, but I like some of the stuff they say. And when you think about just user behavior, that's how a lot of us are. We only have a certain amount of time in our day and we're not going to be interested in X product or all the litany of things we could get into today, but we might someday. And so just figuring out how do I get into some sort of attention to YouTube short, then maybe it's a full length video, then maybe all of a sudden they're on your website, but there's rhythms to this. And I'm totally cool with thousands of people seeing one of our YouTube shorts and only, I mean, I want it to grow, but we don't have a bunch of full length episodes right now for B2B growth that are getting hundreds and hundreds of views. Right. But it's, different strategies. It's different ways of thinking about it. So I also want to see B2B, 
use short form better. So I'm going to keep advocating for it on this podcast, both in creating really fun shorts, but also I think there's ways to tie this short form video movement into things like blogs. Ali, I know you're passionate about that space, but I feel like there has to be other ways we can tie things back uh, and use different mediums to be more personal, to engage different ages. Like I know 30 and under loves these short form video way more than 30 and older. So you're not going to just do short form video, but I would love to see some of it integrated, especially as this next generation is like coming up and they're going to want that video. So oh, don't put them in a box like that. Nope. I, uh, under 30 loves long-term content or long form content just as much that just not the same stuff. That's what, that's all they're, I mean. they're watching YouTube a lot. They're oh, I was, YouTube I was comparing it to written. I think if you can facilitate written content and have video next to it in short form yes. or long form, depending on the piece of content, having both mediums is awesome mm -hmm. and, and is worth exploring how to do both. And that's a great way to update a blog or whatever, you know, content you already have repurpose it. So, okay. Uh, I didn't ask either of you before this episode started. <laughs> so I'm about to put someone on the spot. Do either of you have a YouTube worth highlighting before we close out today's episode? I've got one. It's been my YouTube channel that I always go to. Um, so I personally, oh, there it goes. I just got to the channel. <laughs> so the YouTube channel that I always go to and that I think about kind of frequently when I'm thinking through onboarding and training and education of like product users is always ManyChat. Have you all ever used ManyChat or do you know no. what it is? Nope. So it's like, this is again, like a tactic that's probably a little bit more specific to B2C, but it's um, if you have a really active Facebook company page and you're running contests or processes like many chat, like can integrate into your Facebook and um, kind of help you run those contests and, and answer back for you. They probably have m way more expansive features since I've last used them, but that's how we used them. And they were like really cool ways to also add CTAs and like messenger. Um, but when we were learning how to set them up and create these campaigns, we just went straight through their YouTube channel. We went through one of their education, um, avenues and watched each video one by one. And we never had to talk to support. We never had to talk to sales. It was totally a product led process. And I was like really happy with it. And it was something I'd love to model one day as a, a fun project for a company is like getting a really cool YouTube onboarding experience laid out. Um, so yeah, and you can embed them on your, uh, your like support sites and things like that to make the process easy to find. You can embed them in emails, what have you. I love it. So I just love like the ability to kind of onboard users and provide value on YouTube. That's a good, uh, a good shout out for this episode too, because we're talking about different uses of video. So the correlation is there. I like it. All right. Yep. While you are over there checking that out, remember to also subscribe to B2B Growth. We have two episodes going up weekly. We have shorts content because we believe in YouTube shorts and TikTok. And uh, <laughs> would love for you to, to tune into all of that. Till next time, we're out.